So we propose uh, 3D sys. Uh, it takes uh, as input a 3D scan and the associated RGB images. As output, uh, we predict uh, 3D instance segmentation. Uh, this includes uh, 3D bounding boxes, class labels, and uh, their provoxel instance labels called 3D masks. One significant challenge in jointly using color and the geometry information is the resolution mismatch between the pixels and the voxels. To tackle this problem, we run a series of 2D convolutions on each image. This spatially compressed the RGB input, which we can then back project into 3D grid. At the same time, we run a series of uh, 3D ResNet blocks on the geometric input. Finally, we concatenate both color and the geometry features in 3D. This joint feature serves as a backbone for 3D regional proposal network. This network uh, predicts the object locations with an anchor mechanism. Here, a set of predefined anchors are uniformly spread in 3D space. The network regresses the positive anchors to the target bounding boxes. Then, we can use the predicted bounding box uh, to crop the features for object classification. Finally, uh, we predict uh, uh, per voxel instance masks using a mask backbone uh, composed of a series of 3D convolutions. This gives us the final 3D instance segmentation results. Our network is fully convolutional, so we can train on small chunks and test on the whole scan in a single shot. Large scenes can also be processed at in interactive rates. We evaluate our method on 3D instance segmentation benchmark and outperforms previous and concurrent state-of-the-art method, including a frame-based method like mask RCN uh, projected from 2D to 3D, bottom-up method like SGPN, and a top-down method like R.NET. We also evaluate our method on 3D detection uh, significantly outperforming the state of the art. Our study on the influence of color versus geometry shows the color projection will effectively improve the performance in both tasks. We show real results compared to the state of the art, compared to the thrust tomb point on the left that operates on individual frames, uh, we have more accurate bounding box locations, uh, predictions. Compared to this, uh, the bottom-up method SGPN, in the middle, we have less jittered segmentations. Here, we can see we can achieve pretty accurate instance segmentation result across the common 3D objects, like chairs, desks, etc. So in summary, we propose a, a new approach for 3D instance segmentation that leverages multi-view RGBD data. Our main idea is to jointly learn from color and the geometry. And our network is fully convolutional, so we can uh, run in a single shot on large 3D environments in several seconds. So if you are interested in more details, please come to our process session. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jiwei Huang from Stanford. Uh, we propose the network architecture net, which learn from high resolution signals on meshes via local service parameterization. So here's the example. It's straightforward to do image convolution. For each pixel, we just need to pick a square which is aligned with the image axis and perform the convolution. 
But for 3D, it's not obvious how can you determine such a square. And now our work is to determine the orientation of the square to apply 2D com. There are several related works about convolutions in 3D. For example, the GCNN build a local spherical coordinate at each point, treating each direction equally. The tangent convolutions estimate the tangent space for each point on the point cloud uh, based on the estimate the principal directions. The LSNet tries to learn a mapping from the latent space to the UV atlas in order to generate the new shapes. And all these methods are facing the problem of surface parameterization. And we propose a method for canonical surface parameterization, which is regular and seamless, and we can uh, do the texture convolutions based on it. So here is our pipeline for the semantic segmentation. Our input is the texture mesh. We compute the orientation field for the local surface parameterization. And based on it, we extract the high resolution image patches. We pass through a network to get the high resolution features and associate to the points on the mesh. We pass them through a 3D network containing the texture convolution block to get the final semantic segmentation. Well, let's go back to our previous question. So what is the best surface parameterization method? So example A shows a seamless parameterization, which is, uh, has a uniform scale and the least distortions. Example B maps a surface to a disk. Example C maps it to a square. But which method should we use? Let's read the, the image convolutions. For each pixel, we pick a centered square to apply the convolution. And in 3D, we want to decide such a similar square. An important property in 2D is that all these squares have the same orientation. And then we want to keep these properties in 3D as well. So we, we want to decide the two tangent orthogonal ta vectors uh, associated with each point so that they have the same orientation. And the orientation should uh, canonically align with the shape to reflect the shape properties. That means when we rotate the geometry, the tangent vectors should be rotated accordingly. That's why we borrow the concept of four rows field in the geometry uh, and using the existing method called quadriflow to compute it. And here is an example of the four rows field. Basically, it offers two tangent vectors for each point forming a cross. And the cross is four-way rotational symmetric, and that's why we call it a four rows field. It is um, smoothly aligned uh, at the flattened regions and uh, canonically aligned with the principal directions at the curved regions. So based on this field, for each sample, we can like, uh, extract a square neighbor as shown in this image. With this technique, we can derive a unit-like architecture. For each square, we just uh, need to pick like sample a 10 by 10 image patches and uh, pass through a two-layer network to get the high-resolution features. We associate the feature to the vertex uh, in the mesh, and uh, we can compute the vertex features uh, through the 3D network based on the texture, texture convolution block. In the texture convolution block, for each point, we also uh, sample such a square with several vertices. We split the neighborhood by three by three grids and associate three different weights for each point based on which grid they belong to and aggregate the features with the max pooling layer. We exp uh, experiment our network with two different data sets called ScanNet and Metaverse 3D, and we outperform this data of art by eight or seven percent upon submission. So here is an example. Uh, we are the only method who segments the lamp and the pillow and the trash bin and the windows in these two examples. We also experiment our network with different orientation fields. For example, the random field means like a random direction and tangent space. Eigenvec is uh, principal directions uh, in local region, and intrinsic is a smooth field not aligned with the canonical space, and ours performs the best among them. We also do ablation studies on convolution operators, including point and plus plus and GCNN, and based on the result, ours performs a bit better. We can handle high resolutions up, up to the four millimeter resolution, and we can utilize the high resolution fe uh, features to further improve the performance. Uh, in these two examples, photo frames can be easier identified with high resolution. In conclusion, we propose a canonical local parameterization, and uh, based on it, we can apply texture convolutions, which incorporates the high resolution features. Finally, we improve the performance of segmentation. Our code is publicly available. Thank you. Uh, so we have time for some questions. There's two mics. There's one uh, on this side and the one on the other side. Um, so I'll, I'll get started. I'll get started. 
I will get started with the questions. Uh, so, uh, uh, so on the first talk, I'm I'm wondering, uh, like RGB images are view centric, and then geometry is in some sense view agnostic. So, do you just project features, or there's some kind of translation that you do in order to go from view specific features to view invariant features? Space. Not so sure I understand, but the basic idea is for uh, we training on chunks, and for each chunk we sample some images, like five images, for example, which can cover the most objects uh, in a heuristic way, and we just uh, use these five images and project their features into the volumes. Right. So when you're doing this projection, uh -huh. it, uh, like your features which are coming, from, which are in in, in viewer-centric frame in some sense because they are oh, dependent on the image. Oh, yes. But then when you're putting them onto the mesh, then they are in some sense view-agnostic. So is yes. there something that you have to do over here, or you just no? I would just uh, simply project the features to okay. the uh, chunks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on a related note, I have a question with the texture net, uh, which is essentially, uh, uh, do you? Uh, what do you think? Do you, do you think canonicalizing them in the form of texture, or uh, as opposed to using RGB images, which are view-centric, do you think they'll be benefiting if we were to combine these two approaches? Uh, I think so. Um, so uh, yeah, like there are several ways to utilize the RGB images, and uh, it's not obvious like uh, how we can best utilize them. And uh, in our work, we are trying to say uh, whether we can like uh, project the images to the geometry, and we directly look at the canonical space in the texture. So I think that's maybe the most efficient way to use it uh, in my proposals. And so we have uh, several different experiments in that uh, uh, in our works. So with different uh, kind of parameterization, and we find out like uh, okay, with the canonically uh, uh, aligned direction field, and based on it, when we ex like extract the patches and do the convolution, it may be the best uh, solution. Thank you. Any other any other questions from the audience? Okay, I have, uh, I'll, I'll have another question. So uh, this is on the second talk. Uh, you mentioned that with only a handful of view, hand, handful of uh, uh, frequency samples, you can actually get good reconstruction. I'm wondering, is there an analytical way in which you have to figure out how do you pick these five or ten samples, or 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 uh, or this can be done randomly, or how do you pick these samples? Uh, so we actually we need uh, about ten frequency from the highest frequency. Uh, I mean, to the uh, from the highest frequency, uh, the f the first frequency is uh, about uh, 30 hertz, and the second frequency is about the uh, uh, the first frequency is about 60 hertz, and second is uh, 30. So yeah, so based on the highest frequency. Okay. Uh, let's thank let's thank the speakers again. Hi, uh, hello everyone, I'm Chen. I, I'm going to talk about plane ISN on 3D plane reconstruction. So given this single RGB image, we want to segment it into a set of planar regions. For each planar region, we want to estimate its 3D parameters. Based on the segmentation and 3D parameters, we can compute the depth map and this, uh, a mesh model. The mesh model is smooth and enable many applications. For example, we can put virtual textures and characters based on the detected geometry. We can also use the reconstructed planes for other tasks like SLAM. Many existing work tackle this problem by first generate plane hypotheses and then merge them based on optimization. This method require depth input and lack robustness. Also, the reconstructed planes have no semantic meanings. Two recent work use deep learning techniques to reconstruct planar regions robustly. However, they can only reconstruct a limited number of planes and they lack generalization ability. So in this work, we propose the first detection-based planar reconstruction system and come up with novel techniques to improve the reconstruction quality and a new benchmark for this problem. So our system consists of three parts, a detection network which is able to extract an arbitrary number of planar regions, and a refinement, segmentation refinement network to jointly refine all the masks, and a warping loss module to further improve the reconstruction accuracy. So the detection network is based on MaskSN. MaskSN uses the idea of anchors for bounding box regression. 
Similarly, we use anchors for surface normal regression. Here, we define normal anchors by clustering all possible surface normals in the training set into seven clusters and predict the residual. We use, uh, here I visualize on a semi-sphere. So the detection network extracts an arbitrary number of planar regions. For each planar region, we estimate its segmentation mask and the surface normal. Meanwhile, we use a separate branch for a depth map regression and then compute the plane offset D. So the detection network predicts masks independently for each planar region. And we, to make the masks more consistent, we use another refinement network to jointly refine all the masks in the same global frame. So here's the challenge is to deal with an arbitrary number of masks. To, we use a convol uh, convolution layer to process each mask independently and then sum up the feature maps of all the other masks and concatenate the submission with the current feature map. In this way, we aggregate global information. We repeat the same process multiple times to get the final refined masks. The supervision for the refinement is generated on the fly by matching ground truth masks with the predictions. As the example shown, the refinement masks close step between segments. Finally, we have the warping loss module to further improve the reconstruction accuracy. Here, the idea is simple. If the reconstructed model is perfect, it should also look perfect from any other views. So we transform the model to a nearby view and compare the transformed model against the ground truth model as a nearby view. In this way, uh, as expected, the warping loss module improves the geometry accuracy. To generate the training data, we fit 3D planes based on the 3D mesh models from the ScanNet dataset, and then project 3D fitting results to each camera view to generate a training pair. Here I show our input image, our segmentation results, and reconstructed depth map and 3D mesh models. As results shown, our method is able to reconstruct most planar regions robustly. Quantitatively, our method outperforms all the existing methods by a large margin. Although our model is trained with only indoor images, it can generate reasonable results for many outdoor things. We believe the detection backbone improves the generalization ability. I hope I made everything clear so that you don't have to visit us at post 109. Thank you all for listening. Hello, I'm Lars Meschada from the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems. And in this talk, I present our recent work on occupancy networks, a method for learning 3D reconstruction and function space. In recent years, convolutional neural networks, which operate in the 2D domain, have revolutionized computer vision. However, our world is not two, but three-dimensional. This leads to the question if we can design network architectures that directly output 3D meshes from single images or other types of input. However, unlike in 2D, there is no canonical output representation for 3D geometry. One popular 3D representation is given by voxels. While voxels are a straightforward generalization of pixels to the 3D case, they are severely limited by their cubic memory requirements and are also restricted to a Manhattan world. Alternatively, recent approaches represent geometry as a point cloud. While this approach is fast and easy, it completely discards connectivity information in the output and hence requires additional lossy post-processing. Finally, some recent approaches discretize space in terms of vertices and faces of meshes. However, while this approach might appear natural, it requires a template mesh of the same topology and often leads to artifacts such as self-intersections. As we have seen, existing representations for learning-based 3D reconstruction suffer from discretization artifacts. In this work, we therefore propose occupancy networks, a method, um, uh, another uh, representation for 3D geometry. 
Occupancy networks represent geometry implicitly as the decision boundary of a deep learning classifier. Our new representation has several key advantages. It represents meshes at infinite resolution, can represent arbitrary topologies, and produces watertight meshes. The input to our occupancy network architecture are 3D locations and the output of a task-specific encoder network. The output are occupancy probabilities for each of the 3D points. We condition our network on the task-specific encoding using conditional batch normalization between the fully connected ResNet blocks. During inference, we first evaluate the occupancy network at an initial course resolution. We then incrementally built an octree by marking active voxels, subdividing them, and evaluating the occupancy network at newly introduced grid points. Finally, we extract meshes using the marching cubes algorithm. We now demonstrate how occupancy networks can be used for reconstructing 3D meshes from single RGB images. We first show several baselines. We clearly see that voxel, point, or mesh-based representations result in discretization artifacts. In contrast, our method allows for predicting a smooth and accurate 3D geometry. Next, we show how our method compares to existing approaches for predicting watertight meshes from sparse 3D point clouds. Again, we observe that existing representations suffer from discretization artifacts. In contrast, our method is able to accurately reconstruct the 3D shape from the input. It is also possible to use our method to super-resolve coarsely voxelized inputs by predicting a continuous mesh based on a voxel representation as input. Note how our method is able to predict fine structures from the coarse volumetric inputs. We can also use our method in the context of latent variable models. In this example, we trained a variational autoencoder to obtain a generative model of 3D shapes. Here, we show 3D decodings when linearly traversing the latent space for different object classes. Thanks for your attention. If you want to learn more about occupancy networks, please come to us and talk to us at our poster. Thank you. This is Wei Chongsheng from Beijing Institute of Technology. In this talk, let me introduce our work on 3D shape reconstruction from the image in the frequency domain. This is a joint work with Yun De Jia and Yu Wei Wu. I noticed that the representation of 3D shape in this talk is voxel. Deep neural network has made good process in 3D shape reconstruction owing to their powerful ability to extract prior from big data. However, High-resolution 3D shape reconstruction is a still challenging task due to the cubic growth of the computational cost. In this paper, we propose a foreign-based method to reconstruct a 3D shape in 2D space by predicting slices in the frequency domain, which can achieve a square growth of the computational cost. According to the analysis of the binary image in the frequency space, the reconstruction image with the low frequency information maintained the global shape and the high frequency information at the local details. We found that a binary image can be reconstructed well with just a few information at low frequency. These attributes can be extended to 3D shape. In this figure, the bottom presents the foreign transformation over 3D shape and the top shows the corresponding inverse foreign transformation result. From the left to right, one, two, three red slices are selected along each axis, and the others in gray are set to zero. We found that the reconstruction accuracy reached to 19% only with three slices selected along each x directions. Uh, 
of this observation motivated us to reconstruct 3D shape in the frequency domain. We first predict slices from a single image with a deep neural network, then the slices are embedded into a 3D shape space of which we apply a inverse Fourier transformation to get the final 3D shape. However, due to the information gap between the spatial domain and the frequency domain, it is difficult to learn a projection function from an ordinary image to a slice directly using a deep neural network. To deal with this problem, we introduced an intermediate representation thickness map. We define the thickness map going through the origin of the frequency space as the random transformation of a 3D shape. According to the following slice theorems, a slice going through the origin of frequency space at an orientation R equal to the following transformation of the corresponding thickness map at the same orientation. For 2D slices without going through the origin, we extend the following slice theorems and show that these slices are the following transformation of a complex thickness map in which the real and the imaginary part is the random transformation of a 3D shape after the sine weighted preprocessing. Now, instead of predicting the slice directly, we predict the thickness map with a deep neural network and calculate the slices in the frequency domain used uh, with the following transformation. We can see that the thickness map keeps the geometry structure of 3D shape in the spatial domain. Considering that the image is also a spatial projection of 3D shape, the gap between the image and the thickness map is much smaller than that between the image and the frequency slices, uh, which is benefit for the training of our neural network. The next question is how many slices do we need to reconstruct a 3D shape? More slices lead to a high accuracy but a heavy computational burden. To make our model more efficient, we introduce another theorem to show that the thickness map at high frequency and the corresponding low frequency are conjugate, so that we can just predict the low frequency thickness map with a deep neural network and get the corresponding high frequency thickness map for free with a conjugate relationship. So we test the reconstruction accuracy of the 3D shape at a different resolution with a different number of slices. We found that predict three slices along each axis is enough for an accuracy reconstruction result. Oh, we design a deep neural network based on auto-decoder auto uh, structures to predict the signals map from the image. We first predict the cell hold and edges of the signals map along three axis direction separately. Then the cell hold and edges are combined together to predict in different thickness maps with a theories of sub neural networks. We evaluate our reconstruction method from both the computational efficiency and the reconstruction accuracy. And the, re the experimental results on shipping edit sets validate that the proposed method can achieve a satisfactory result in an efficient way. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much. Let's invite the speakers on the stage for questions. Any, uh, any questions from the audience? There's two mics, one on the left, one on the right. Are they on? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, this is for MPI. Um, so on the surface of it, no pun intended, these, um, the occupancy net and the deep uh, sign distance function have some similarities, right? So could you comment on, on sort of the differences from your point of view? Okay, yeah. I mean, the obvious uh, difference is that uh, the deep um, sense distance function predicts uh, sense distance functions, right? And we pro, um, predict occupancies. So there are advantages and disadvantages to both, I guess, uh, because occupancies um, are probably a bit, little bit easier to learn because you only have to uh, predict the sign correctly, while uh, for sign distance functions, you have to get the uh, value correct. On the other hand, for sign distance um, fields, you um, also have more information. For example, if you want to project onto a surface, it might be helpful to have a sign distance function. Does uh, it answer your question? So, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> another question about occupancy networks. Uh, I wondered if you compared your uh, solution to Kushdan's uh, Poisson reconstruction. He also tries to distinguish points uh, in so, and out. So uh, in our work, we didn't uh, compare to Poisson reconstruction. However, we have a very, we have a very sparse uh, amount of input points. So we have 300 noisy input points. And for this, 
for solar surface reconstruction uh, struggles a lot. In fact, uh, what we did was to run uh, for some surface reconstruction on the output of uh, the point set generation network, which is already cleaned and has uh, uh, a thousand um, output points. And uh, there, even it doesn't uh, usually work very well. So it's uh, really hard for thin details to get the input and out output right, outside right. <laughs> Any more questions from the audience? I guess I have one question. Uh, so in the last talk, uh, which you presented uh, that you can reason on this frequency uh, domain, I'm wondering how easy is it to train these networks because you have global dependencies in some sense, and how well do they generalize to novel uh, categories that you may not have necessarily trained on? Uh, okay, actually we, we did not test uh, uh, this. this you know. Uh, we just uh, we just predict yeah, because we predict the zero hold and the age at three draw view, and this uh, you can see the uh, zero hold and the signals map will share the same geometry structures. So we think this is more easy to training uh, training our neural network. Yeah. Um, I have one final question for. Uh, 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 Chen, uh, so when you presented uh, plane RCN, I mean, so you, there, is, there is this notion in psychology about amodal completion, that humans can sort of complete surfaces across occluders that are interrupting them. Did you see similar behavior in the net models that you are training, or do you have to build it in, or do you want to say something about this? Yeah, that's a very good question. So we also consider try to infer the occluded part, but uh, I think in terms of methods, our methods can handle occluded part. But when we generate training data, it's very hard to generate the training data for the occluded part. I think if we have very good training data, our method can be extended to handle the occluded occlusion. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Let's thank, let's, let's thank the speakers again. And if the speakers for 10, 11, and 12 are here, they should come up right now. <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm Ryota Natsume from Varsity University. In this work, we present a framework for closed human 3D construction from a single image. Given a single image, our method can recover the 3D surface of the person with clothing, and also infer the texture, uh, including the anti-size, such as backside. Close human construction from a single image is challenging due to the vast range of possible shapes and appearances that close human can take in the real world. Furthermore, from a single image, a large portion of human body is occluded. Thus, we need to infer the missing geometry and texture. Boxers are a common representation of 3D geometry for shape modeling. However, I argue that uh, Boxer is not good, a choi good choice for closed human digitization due to its large memory footprint. And large memory footprint uh, not only restricts the resolution, but also restricts design choices. So we looked for more efficient yet expressive data representation for closed human. Inspired by traditional computer graphic techniques called visual hall, we propose closed human digitization pipeline where 3D shapes are implicitly represented by a set of silhouettes. Our silhouette-based representation has following advantages. First, our method uh, supports shape, large shape variation. Also, the building blocks of our pipeline becomes lightweight. Additionally, we present texture synthesis method allowing us to reconstruct fully textural meshes. Let me introduce our system. This is overview. I will explain one by one. Given an input image, we first extract the 2D silhouette and 3D uh, joint location. Then we make 2D joint image from input view and target views. These images are fed into silhouette synthesis network to generate plausible 2D silhouettes from novel viewpoints. Uh, from synthesized silhouettes, we apply deep learning based visual hall algorithm to incorporate shape prior. I'll omit this part and please come to our poster for more detail. For texture, we infer the box view of the subject from an input image and 2D silhouette. Finally, finally, by stitching the front view and back view, 
we get the fully textual 3D closed human. Uh, let me explain each component in detail. First is multi-view silhouette synthesis, which inside a novel view silhouette from a 2D silhouette and 2D ports of the input view and 2D ports of the target views. The advantages of synthesizing silhouettes uh, instead of RGB, RGB images are twofold. First, silhouette synthesis can be seen as a pixel-wise binary classification problem, which can be more stably trained without extensive hyperparameter tuning. Secondly, since we don't need to store 3D mesh explicitly, our shape representation is more memory efficient and like voxel representation. Lastly, I will explain our texture inference method. We, uh, we, we propose to infer missing textures by inferring the backside of the subject in a pixel-aligned manner using an image-to-image -image translation network. This way, we can fully leverage the visible information, uh, covering the wider variation in textures of the closed human. We compare our method with the state-of-the-art four-view reconstruction algorithm uh, using a deep neural network and eight-view naive visual holes. Although our method uses only a single image as an input, we can get comparable reconstructions. And it's important to note that we infer not only geometry, but also textures, while the existing method does not provide missing textures. Finally, let me show you uh, our reconstruction result using internet photos obtained from deep fashion data set. Uh, the, the video shows we can reconstruct a uh, closed human body shape with plausible complete texture from a single image. Uh, please, come, please come to see our poster for more information and discussion. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Hao Zhu from Nanjing University. It is my honor to, uh, to be here to present our work, The Detailed Human Shape Estimation from a Single Image by Hierarchical Mesh Deformation. In this work, we propose a novel learning-based framework to recover the human shape from a single image, which combines the robustness of parametric model with the flexibility of freeform 3D deformation. Firstly, let's briefly review the previous works. It can be divided into two groups. As shown in the left, the first group predicts the coefficients of a parametric model. And in the right, the second group predicts a non-parametric model, like the shape expressed in volts of space. Both kinds of work focus on recovering general shape and face the same problem, which is that they cannot recover the shape details. To solve this problem, we propose a novel framework consisting of multiple networks to reconstruct the shape from cause to fun. There are two key novelties in our method. The first is that we propose a hierarchical deforming framework. As shown in this figure, in the higher level, we use less handle points to recover general information, like human pose and body size. And in the lower level, we use more handle points to refine the detailed shape, like wrinkles. It is worth mentioning that we can hardly find the human in the wild database, which has detailed human shape. Therefore, we have utilized the information which is available from the ex uh, existing human data sets to train our network, including body joint, silhouette, and shading information. The second novelty of our method is a project predict deform strategy, by which we firstly fit the 3D mesh to the 2D space, and then we use the neural networks predicts the mesh deform deformation parameters, which is the handle movement. And finally, we feed back, to, uh, feed back the parameters to the 3D mesh using Laplacian meshing editing method. Here is the overall pipeline. First, an initial simple model is estimated from the source image. Then the next three stages serve as the refinement phases, which predicts the deformation of the mesh, so as to refine the meshes and produce the detailed human shape. We use, <coughs> we use three data sets for the training and testing. The wild data set assembles nearly 30,000 images with sparse 2D joints and segmentation annotated from available human data sets, including LSP, COCO, Human 3.6 million, MP2. 
this data, set, this data set is used for training and testing. We also make two other small data sets, Reckon and Sense data set with scanned or synthesized ground truth chip to evaluate 3D errors. For the training of the shading net, we capture the additional RGBD data with Connect2 as label and use the oversmoothed depth as input for training. The shading net is further fine-tuned on wild data set with photometric loss. We show some results in the live to compare our method, abbreviated as HMD, to other methods. You can see that our method yields visually better result. Our recovered model fits better to the joint and silhouette, and the wrinkle level shape details are also recovered. In the animation in the right, we show our results stage by stage. You can see that our HMD framework refines the human mesh model from cost to fine. We also compare our results with other methods quantitatively. In the wild data set, we, our method leads into 2D metrics such as silhouette, IOU, and 2D joint error. You reckon data set and the same data set, we compare the 3D surface error. And our method leads to methods using parametric models and also methods based on volumetric based prediction. Here we show our recovered 3D model on the Reckon and synthetic data sets together with the ground truth mesh. Our method can predict plausible results with respect to the south view in the middle. But from the side view in the right, we can see that the inherent pose and shape ambiguities cannot be resolved with the image from a single viewpoint, which is the main source of 3D surface error. As for the application, our method could be used for novel view synthesis by simply mapping the image to the mesh as texture. For, from the side view in the right, we can see that we have got better textured model as the recovered mesh fits the image better. Thanks for the attention. Our code and paper can be accessed in GitHub by scanning this QR code. Hello everyone, I'm Nikos Kolotouros from the University of Pennsylvania and today I'll present our work on human shape reconstruction from single images using convolutional mesh regression. In this work, given as input a single image of a person, our goal is to estimate the full 3D shape of this person. This task goes beyond estimating just a skeleton of 3D joints and instead requires the recovery on the full surface of the body. The traditional way to address this problem is through optimization-based approaches. Relevant works first detect informative features in the image, for example, silhouettes, part segmentation, or 2D joints, and then fit a human body model to this evidence using iterative optimization. Here you can see the evolution of this fitting process for the simple body model, starting from a neutral pose until convergence. Unfortunately, the fitting procedure is slow and can fail while detections are wrong or ambiguous. This problem have shifted the interest towards regression-based approaches, where instead a deep network is used to estimate the body model parameters directly from an image. With the regress parameters, we can then reconstruct a mess that corresponds to the human shape. Past works have focused mainly on the input representation for the deep network, using as input RGB images, silhouettes and key points, part segmentation, images and key points, or even dense landmarks. In all these cases, the target representation is always the set of parameters of the simple body model. This can be problematic because we have a strong reliance on the parameter space of the model, meaning that we cannot express deformations beyond this representation, like hair, clothing, and potentially hard articulation or facial expressions that is the focus of recent work. Another important aspect is that the input representation of the model might not be friendly for direct regression. In the case of simple, for example, the post-parameter space requires the estimation of 3D rotations, which have been proven to be a very challenging regression target. This means that we might have to rethink the way we regress 3D human shape. Our first insight is instead of hard coding a finicky latent representation, it should be easier to regress directly the 3D coordinates of the mesh vertices, and this can give us freedom to regress in shape possible. But considering the number of vertices on these models, this should complicate the problem. And here comes our second insight that instead of using a series of fully connected layers to regress the vertex coordinates, the problem becomes much easier if we use a graph scene for the regression. These insights are exactly what define our approach. 
convolutional mass regression, where we use a graph neural network to regress the 3D coordinates of a human body mass given a single image as input. Let us see in more detail how this works. Given an image, we extract features using a standard CNN. We then attach these features to the vertices of a human body template mass, along with the 3D coordinates of its vertex. This means that we have encoded global information from the image features and local information from the vertex coordinates. Then the graph CNN performs the feature processing. In each layer, per vertex feature transformations are followed by neighborhood pooling. Here's the output of the first layer, the second layer, and layer number n. In the end, its vertex regresses its coordinates in the deformed mass. If we gather all output vertices, we can generate the full mesh surface that corresponds to the 3D shape of the person. Finally, in cases we do need to conform to a specific parametric model, having the full 3D shape makes it easy to regress the model parameters on top of that. We found that a simple MLP is enough for this task. We observed that the regressed and parametric shapes are comparable qualitatively and quantitatively. We benchmark our approach in a variety of datasets. In human 3.6 million, we evaluate 3D pose accuracy using the skeleton recovered from the shape and where it performed the other model-based approaches. In LSP, we evaluate part segmentation through mass reprojection. We achieve results competitive to the state of the art among approaches that return a human body mass. Here you can see some more results on in the wild videos from the recent 3DPW dataset. We underline that these are frame-by-frame -frame results without any temporal smoothing. Notice how results are more stable than the state of the art approach of Kanazawa et al. Finally, we demonstrate the potential of our approach to capture details beyond the simple model space. The data comes from, from the people's snapshot dataset. Notice how our mess deforms to capture details like hair and clothing. But considering the size of this dataset, we cannot perform a more detailed evaluation, but we believe this is a very interesting direction for future work. We have released the training and testing code for our approach. Please visit the project page for more details or come to poster 114 to talk with us. Thank you. Tell the speakers up. Uh, let's see if are there any questions from the audience. So I have a I have a question for the for the last speaker. Um, so are there sort of are there parts of the sort of in addition to the mesh and the, and the the hair and the clothing are there parts of the sort of simple space that are sort of hard to find that your system is able to detect because it has this mesh based representation in okay. the sense of like for example pose. Uh, in general, like regressing 3D rotations is hard because like depending on the representation, uh, for example, if we use axis angle, then we have periodicity issues. Uh, if we use catenaries, we have uh, discontinuity. So like it's the formulation that we regress the 3D coordinates instead of the uh, post parameters that makes it like more robust. And I have a question for the, actually for the first two um, speakers. So uh, this, is, this is really cool work. And what's interesting is you've, you've taken in lots of information from different sort of different sorts of training sets and you have sort of different, you uh, have for, you know, things that are by pose and things that are by silhouette and you have different sorts of uh, essentially training signals. Are there certain types of data sets that as people who are trying to estimate things about people that you would love to see that would make your lives much easier? Mm -hmm. And some, are, are there certain things you'd want to see in the future? Are, are, are there, the question is, are there, are there certain types of data sets that you would like to see capture that would enable you to do new and even cooler things? Mm -hmm. mm, sorry. Mm, so I didn't catch the question. So uh, could you uh, talk after the, this? Or okay, we'll, we'll yeah. do this offline. Okay. So maybe I, yeah, sure. So maybe I, I answer this question. Yeah, well, currently we are using the uh, data sets, uh, the human data set on, only consist, uh, uh, contains the silhouette and the uh, uh, joint and the pose, something like that, but the lack of the 3D shape. Uh, so in the future, I think we need more, more data sets to, with the detailed human shape. That's, but that is very difficult for, to capture the 3D shape uh, from human in the wild. So, um, I think uh, they will, they will, in the near future, we will uh, be able to capture this when, when the uh, 3D con reconstruction method be becomes uh, mature. Thanks. Well, let's, let's thank the speakers again.
Hello, everyone. I'm Buru Atekin, and I'm going to present our work, H plus O, Unified Egocentric Recognition of 3D Hand Object Poses and Interactions. This is a work we carried out at the Microsoft Mixed Reality and AI Lab in Zurich with Federica Bogo and Mark Polaface. In this work, we present a unified framework for understanding 3D hand and object interactions from RGB images. Our model jointly estimates the 3D hand and object poses, models their interactions, and recognizes the object and action classes with a single forward pass through a neural network. We further merge and propagate information in the temporal domain to infer interactions between hand and object trajectories and recognize actions. Taking color images, a significant amount of research has focused on visual understanding of hands and objects in isolation from each other. However, the problem of jointly understanding hands and objects, although crucial for a semantically meaningful understanding of the visual scene, has received far less attention. There are a few relevant studies that attempt to reason about hands in interaction with objects. However, these works are limited by a few factors. Firstly, they either rely on active depth sensors for multi-camera systems. Secondly, they do not reason about the action the subject is performing. While estimating the 3D hand pose is crucial for many applications in robotics and graphics, the sole knowledge of the pose lacks semantic meaning about the actions of the subject. Thirdly, they focus mostly on only capturing hand motion without recovering the object pose in 3D and therefore lack environmental understanding. In our work, we aim to tackle all these issues by the following three contributions. First, we propose a unified framework for recognizing 3D hand and object interactions. While doing so, we simultaneously solve four tasks, that is 3D hand pose estimation, 60 object pose estimation, object recognition, and activity classification. Secondly, we introduce a novel single-shot neural network framework that jointly solves for the 3D articulated and rigid pose estimation problems within the same architecture. And finally, we present a temporal model to explicitly model interactions and infer relations between hand and objects directly in 3D. This work is the first RGB video-based method for joint 3D hand object pose estimation and activity recognition. So this is an overview of our architecture for unified egocentric scene understanding. We first process each frame with a fully convolutional network to produce a 3D regular grid. In contrast to YOLO or SSD-based approaches, we produce a 3D grid to store 3D locations instead of a 2D grid. The ground truth values for hand and object poses are stored at their corresponding cell locations in 3D. We parameterize both hand and object poses jointly with 3D control points corresponding to skeleton joints for the hand pose and 3D object bounding box locations for the object pose. We associate these cells further with vectors that contain target ground truth values for the 3D hand and object locations. In addition to hand and object control point locations, our network also predicts high confidence values for cells where the hand or the object is present and low confidence where they are not present. We further store into the vectors object and primitive action classes for object and activity recognition. We train our network with a joint loss function that simultaneously solves for hand pose estimation, object pose estimation, object and activity recognition tasks. To model longer term dependencies across sequential frames, we add a recurrent module to our architecture. Instead of directly feeding the high confidence hand and object poses as input to the temporal module, inspired by recent studies on relational understanding, we model dependencies between hands and objects with a composite learned function and only then give the resulting mapping as input to RNN to explicitly model hand-object interactions directly in 3D. Our ablation analysis demonstrates that the combination of hand and object poses significantly improves the action recognition accuracy. With interaction modeling, performance improvements are even more noticeable. We further demonstrate in our ablation analysis that our unified framework allows us to achieve better overall performance in targeted tasks as compared to dedicated individual networks. In our state-of-the-art comparison on the first-person hand-action data set, we show quantitatively that our contributions allow us to achieve state-of-the-art performance on a diverse set of tasks, even in comparison to approaches that work on depth data and ground truth pose annotations while running at real-time speeds. For more information about our work, please come by our poster, which is at stand number 115. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Zhen Qili from Cornell. Today, I will present our work on learning the depths of moving people by watching frozen people. This work was done while I was an intern at Google Research. Our goal is to predict dense depth maps from an ordinal, ordinal video like this one, where both the camera and the people in the scenes are freely moving. Classical stereo algorithms assume the objects and the scene are rigid across views. This requires either a static scene or a multi-camera system, which does not apply in our case. Such classical methods typically treat moving objects as noise or completely ignore them, leading to incorrect results as shown here. We tackle this fundamental challenge in using a data-driven approach, and this video shows the depth prediction from our approach. However, data for learning depths of moving people in the wild is difficult to collect at scale. In this work, we create apply a new data set called Mannequin Challenging. It contains thousands of YouTube videos of people imitating mannequins, freezing in natural poses with a handheld camera towards the scenes. Our data set spans range of scenes, poses, and number of people. Because the people are stationary, we can then use structure for motion and the multi-view stereo algorithm to recover camera poses and depths. The recover multi-view stereo depth maps are then used as ground truth supervision for training a neural net. But how can we design a model that's trained on videos of frozen people, but then apply it to videos of moving people at inference time? One simple idea is to treat it as a single image depth prediction problem meaning we train a convolution neural net to regress to multi-view stereo depths from a single RGB frame. However, this ignores the 3D information available in neighboring frames in the video sequence. Therefore, we also include depths computed from motion parallax as an additional input. In particular, we compute the optical flow between reference frames and neighbor frames and convert the flow into depths using camera poses. At inference time, the depths computed from moving people will be inaccurate, so we mask out the initial depths in human regions using a segmentation mask. So our full model takes as inputs the RGB frame, a human segmentation mask, mask the depths from motion parallax, and the associated confidence map. We ask the network to predict NVS depths from these inputs, and intuitively, the network learns to impaint the depths of the masked human region well, at the same time, in learning to refine the depths of the entire thing. During inference, we can then apply this model directly to video of moving people, like the example shown here. We test our trained model by directly applying it to the TUM RGBD dataset, which features moving camera and moving, moving people. In this case, we compare our model with a baseline RGB only method, as well as other motion stereo and single view methods. This plot shows our full model outperforms the baseline method and has the best performance among all our prior approaches. We also performed a qualitative comparison on this data set. The last column of this slide shows the depth predictions of our full model are the most similar to the ground truth and are more accurate than other approaches. Here are the results on our regular internet video clips where both the camera and the people are freely moving. Compared to recent state-of-art learning-based depth prediction methods, our results are more accurate and coherent over time. Furthermore, our depth predictions can be directly using a variety of visual effects, such as video synthetic defocus and the focus pause, as in the examples shown here. Synthetic objects may also be inserted into the scene and are properly occluded by the moving people and the environment using our depth prediction. We can also use our depth prediction to synthesize novel views of the scenes by using nearby, frame, nearby frames in the videos to fill in this occlusion in the new views. Moreover, when the camera and the people in the scene are freely moving, most of human regions can be effectively, effectively impainted using our depth prediction. We have released the code and the data set in our website. Thanks for your attention and hope to see you at the poster section 116.
Hi, uh, everyone. Uh, I'm Zhen Pei Yang from UT Austin. Uh, today, I'm excited to share with you our work on extreme relative pose estimation by scene completion. Uh, relative pose estimation aims at estimate a rigid transform between two scans to align them together. This model is an essential building block of 3D reconstruction system. There have been many prior works on this topic. Uh, most of them admit the following paradigm. Firstly, uh, extract feature points on both scans, then match those feature points and compute the rigid transform. Such paradigm has been successfully deployed in commercial 3D reconstruction system, which uh, often requires high frame rate videos as input. Uh, one reason is they need sufficient overlap between the two scans in order for the relative pose estimation to be correct. In this work, uh, we further consider the case where the two scans have small or no overlap and shows that our specific design algorithm can perform much better than previous method. The reason for considering small and non-overlap cases uh, is because there are many potential applications. For example, reconstruction from a film snapshots, early detection of loop closure, or solving jigsaw puzzles. Uh, let's recall how human perform relative pose estimation when there are a few, uh, there are little overlap between the two scans. Imagine you are given a front view and a back view of a human. Although this, these two scans have little overlap, we can still assemble these two scans together uh, with the principle in mind that they form together must be a, a plausible human body. Uh, such examples tell us that the knowledge of the complete observation may be helpful in this task. Thus, we propose following uh, approach. Firstly, we infer the two uh, complete things uh, from partial observations using completion module. And then we use uh, our relative post module to estimate the uh, to estimate the transform between the complete scene. And furthermore, using current relative pose estimation, we transform each scan into the other's local coordinate system and perform completion again. We, perf uh, we alternate this completion and matching step to give best performance. And next, I'm going to introduce the two modules. Uh, for the completion task, we adopt a reduced the cube map representation, which consists of left view, front view, uh, uh, back view, and uh, right view. Uh, with the observed the front view, we are going to complete the rest of the three views. Uh, we adopt a multimodal representation besides the color image. We also com uh, complete the depth map, normal maps, uh, semantic map, and the pre-trained feature map. Uh, we adopt an encoder-decoder structure for our completion network. Uh, the inputs are first passed through several unshared layers to extract modality-specific information, and the extracted features are then concatenated and passed through following layers. Um, results shows that uh, our completion model can give uh, meaningful extrapolation. A close examine at the completion result shows that the completion are prone to errors. Then we need a more robust uh, algorithm to tolerate the noise ratio. Uh, we propose to combine the strengths of two popular uh, matching algorithms, spectrum matching and iter uh, iterative related list grid uh, by optimizing the following objective. We can optimize such objective through alternate minimize rotation, translation, and the spectrum weight. We evaluate our method on three data sets, SunCG, Metaport, and the ScanNet. We divide the scan pairs into three regimes, uh, large overlap, small overlap, and no overlap. We evaluate uh, angular errors and translation errors. Besides comparing against four baselines, we also show ablation study results on, our, uh, on removing the completion module or remove the alternation step. Uh, quantitative results shows that our method can gain slight improvements in large overlap case. The improvement become more salient in small and no overlap case. Uh, here are qu uh, qualitative results. Each row is one, uh, each column is one example. The first two rows are wrong choose. The third row is our prediction and the rest are baselines. Uh, these are on some CG data sets. Okay. And uh, here are the results for Metaport and scan net. We also show ablation study on our pairwise matching module. Uh, we found that uh, combining spectral matching with iterative related list will uh, give best performance. Thank you for your attention, and please uh, come to our poster session for more details. Thank you. OK, 
Okay, do we have any questions from the audience? Okay, um, so I, I have a question for the, for the second speaker. Um, so this is a this is very, very creative source of data. So did the idea come before the data or did someone see the, the this mannequin challenge and think, oh, we can use this for the data? Was it, were you, were you searching for the data or were you, did you just see this and say, oh, this is a very cool thing, what can we do with this? Oh, I think the basic thing is that uh, my advisor knows us, namely, they have like uh, this data set a long time ago. So, but, and he originally showed me this data set and uh, I just told him, how many data, uh, how many videos we have like for such types of video because originally we might think there are only like uh, maybe a few hundred of uh, dozens of such video but uh, yeah he told me like there are like more than like 10,000 such videos in the internet in the YouTube videos and and we just say hi yeah maybe we can do something for this data set yeah so that's the like uh, original story I think from this data set. Very cool. Uh, I have a question for the, for the third speaker so uh, if I'm if I'm trying to predict, for example, the, the walls of like a, of a, a room with four walls, there, there are often some ambiguities. And so when you run into the uh, no overlap case, do you have any sorts of issues with the sort of multimodal possibilities of where the, where the scans could be? Uh, yeah, uh, this is a very good question. Uh, yes, uh, um, there are actually many ambiguities in no overlap cases. And we think uh, maybe uh, one uh, future direction is to evaluate this more correctly by generating multiple uh, multiple uh, answers for this no overlap case registration. Thank you. Thanks. And uh, last question is for the first speaker. Uh, so you have, you can learn, you're learning all these things jointly, and so you can, you can make these predictions, but you could also look at sort of what the networks have learned, and is there any idea of how you can use that to learn about the relationships between these, uh, in the sense of you can just put in a large data set and look at the, what the network weights, for example, contain? Uh, yeah, it definitely makes sense to visualize the weights and what the network has learned. Our intuition was that these tasks are highly uh, interrelated, hand pose estimation, object pose estimation, and activity recognition. Um, since these tasks are highly interrelated, um, I assume that what, what the network learns um, uh, are common features that are useful for all of these tasks. Great. Let's, let's thank the speakers again. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, this is Xiao Guang Han from Chinese University of Hong Kong, Shenzhen campus. Today I'm going to present uh, a skeleton bridge uh, deep learning approach for 3D object reconstruction from single view RGB images. Existing uh, deep learning based methods for this task firstly uh, encode the pixels into a Latin rep representation and then design a 3D decoder for geometry inference. Uh, different geometry, uh, geometric representa representations indu uh, induce different uh, decoder designs. RTN2 use 3D CNNs for volumetric generation, and point cell generation directly regress the 3D points. At least that, use MLPs for mesh gener generation. Pixel mesh learns the uh, deformation of a template mesh using graph CNNs. All of these methods uh, fail to capture complex topologies. To address this issue, our key idea is to uh, formulate the problem into a cost fine manner. We first of all recover structure and then generate a surface from the structure. The structure of a 3D shape in our work is represented by its skeleton, which can be treated as a point set generated by sinking the surface points along the reverse normal directions. In our work, we introduce the skeleton as a bridge into a pipeline. Uh, due to its uh, light property of topology modeling and also its lower learning complexity due to its uh, compact compactness. Okay, so our approach is consisting of three stages. We firstly directly regress the 3D scatter points from the input image using uh, MLPs. And in the second, sta in the second stage, uh, we firstly convert the scatter points into the volumetric representation. And then we apply 3D CNNs to map the scatter, uh, scatter points uh, uh, volumetric into a scattering volume. After that, we extract uh, a best mesh from the uh, infer the skeleton volume. And in the final stage, the graph uh, CN is adopted to learn the deformation of the best mesh to fit the tactic surface. 
And uh, uh, for each stage, we also integrate an individual image encoder. Um, such uh, multi-level encoders help us to capture the structure information and uh, uh, the surface details uh, progressively, and also help to correct the accumulated predicted errors. And our stage-wise approach uh, can take uh, the respect, respective adva advantages of different geometrical re representations. Okay, as observed, uh, the scatter points are composed of uh, curve-shaped uh, curve parts and surface-shaped parts. So uh, we propose a lower design of two parallel MLP-based uh, uh, inference network for scatter inference, one for generating the curve-like points and one for generating the surface-like points. And uh, uh, for the ground truth scatter points, before the training, we firstly convert uh, to do the class classify all the points into two parts using a PCA-based methods. And we also use the chamfer distance and Laplacian smoothness term to define the primary loss functions for such scatter points inference. And we uh, conduct our experiments on uh, the shape-led data set. From the qualitative com comparison, you can see that. So RTN2 and point set generation generate the low resolution outputs, which are difficult to, uh, for the uh, extracting the clean surface. Both atlas layout and pixel mesh are difficult to capture the uh, accurate topology. While our approach can generate uh, uh, a closed surface uh, with correct topology and uh, more details. We use chamfer distance and the Earth's move distance to, uh, for our quantitative compa comparisons. As soon as our uh, method reaches daily out. So we also test our model on real images. For each input image, uh, the results of Atlas Layout and uh, our approach are shown side by side. And uh, this uh, validates the general, generalization ability of our method. We also conduct uh, a brain study on our three-stage pipeline. First, uh, we remove the scattered inference stage by directly generating the scattered volume from image using a generating or uh, octree generating network. Second, we replace the uh, we replace the voxel-based correction method uh, by directly uh, erodes the scatter points into a uh, cost volume before the best method extraction. So from the experiment results, we can see that necessity of each stage. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Bing Bing from National University of Singapore. Today, I'm going to present our work on geometry-aware rolling shutter correction. This work was done when I was an intern in NEC Labs. Rolling shutter cameras are very popular, especially in digital products, because they are cheaper than global shutter cameras. However, in rolling shutter cameras, each scan line is exposed one by one sequentially. And this causes distortion when the image is captured during motion. In this work, we propose a method to remove such distortion from the images. Removing such distortion exactly requires to recover both the 3D structure and camera motion between scan lines. The main difficulty here is that the rolling shutter geometry is very complicated due to the intro frame camera motion. Another difficulty is the potential ambiguity in some configurations. The first contribution in our work is to prove that the rolling shutter two-view structure for motion under pure translation is degenerate. And this motivates us to develop a learning approach to directly predict the camera motion, uh, motion and depth from one single image. It relies on a data-driven approach to handle the difficulty in geometry by learning the same prior. And it's structure and motion aware because we actually recover the structure and motion for a rolling shutter correction. To give more details, uh, we prove that the rolling shutter two-view structure for motion under pure translation will have infinitely many solutions for the per scan line camera position and depth. Briefly, this is because of the radiating pattern in the 2D displacement under pure translation. 
And this is a serious issue because pure translation is very common in practice. Our single view framework simply contains two sub networks, one for depth prediction and the other one for camel velocity regression. Although with a traditional geometrical approach, it's generally impossible to estimate the camel velocity from one single image. We show here that the CN can learn such motion from the, uh, from the uh, distortion in the image. The network, the network output is then leveraged uh, to um, rectify the, the distortion in the image. Specifically, we do this by back project by back projecting all the 3D points into the image plane corresponding to the first scan of the camera. To generate training data, we rely on the KT sequence. We use the stereo to compute the depth. And then given the camera velocity, we are able to render the rolling shutter image and depth by warping. Such warping produce images with different size. So we, to fit into a deep learning toolbox, we can resize all the images to the same size. However, we find that this affects training. And it is because the 2D displacement caused by vertical resizing is very similar to the 2D displacement caused by a small rotation in a rolling shutter camera. This is very similar to the well-known best relief ambiguity. To avoid such issue, we use the image cropping instead of resizing. We first test our method on synthetic data where we have ground truth warping flow to get a rectified images. We compare with two existing 2D deformation methods, and it's clear that only our warping flow can reflect the scene structure and therefore get the rectified images closer to the ground truth. We also show results on a rare uh, rolling shutter image where the depth variation causes different distortion in different image, uh, different regions. And it's clear that the subtle deformation on the car in the near ground is best rectified by our method. And yet the house in the far ground also become up upright by our corrections. To conclude, we identify and improve a degeneracy in rolling shutter tubule geometry. And we show the importance of the geometric guidance to the rolling shutter correction. The same idea can also be applied to machine deblurring in the future. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Su Da Peng from Zhejiang University. Today, I'm going to talk about paper, pixel-wise voting network for six-door post estimation. Object post estimation is the fundamental problem in computer vision. Given a 3D object like a cat, we can take its image using a camera. And how the cat looks like in the image depends on its relative pose to a camera. And this is called object pose, which can be described by translation and rotation in 3D, and has these degrees of freedom. And now, given an RGB image, we want to estimate the object pose. This is actually a long-standing problem in computer vision. Previous methods can be summarized as four categories, template matching, key point based, hope voting, and post regression. And our method is a key point based approach. The key point based approach has a two stage pipeline. As you in the image, we first find the set of 3D 2D correspondences. Then we recover the 6D pulse by solving a perspective and point problem. That's how straightforward. But the question is how to find 3D, 2D point correspondences. Traditional methods rely on sparse feature matching like SIFT, but they are sensitive to appearance changes and not robust enough. And the recent trend is to detect semantic key points using convolutional neural networks. For example, for this cat, we first define a set of 3D key points Voice, like its ears, feet, and tail. And then we use the network to detect their 2D projections. 
And in the network, the most common representation for 2D key points is heat map, which achieves the state of our performance. But there are two challenges for this representation. One is occlusion. If the cat is occluded and its invisible key points are hard to be localized. And the second is truncation. When the key points are outside the image, the heat map cannot represent them. So how to robustly localize invisible key points? Look at this image. How can we accurately localize the right ear of this cat? To robustly solve, to solve this problem, in our paper, we propose a vector field representation for key points. Specifically, we predict a vector at each pixel point to the key points. Then the intersection of two vectors gives a key point location. In this way, our method has a advantage is that we can handle invisible key points, which is occluded or even outside the image. Another advantage of our representation is dense wording. Every key pixel gives a key point location, which is more stable. And from these dense wordings, we can also estimate the key point uncertainty. For example, a key a covariance matrix for the key points. And then we do this for key points. And finally, we, solve, we recover the, the, the object pose by solving a modified PMP. We consider the key point covariance in the reprojection error function. And this is our results on public benchmarks. We outperform the state of art by a large margin on line mode and occlusion. And this is the visualization of our results. The left is input, and the right are 2D projections of 3D models with our estimate pulse. And for occluded objects, we can still obtain stable results. And our method is also fast enough for real-time AI application. For example, we can put a virtual hat on, on the cat's head. And when it's moved out of the in image or occluded by the hand, we can still obtain stable results. And thank you for your listening. Our code is available GitHub, and welcome to our poster. So uh, I'll begin. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Ah, yes. Hi. Uh, this is a question regarding the work on rolling shutter correction. Uh, I just wanted to know what what uh, types of motion are you able to handle? Because the videos and the data sets that you showed, they appear to be having a unidirectional motion, you know, on only forward or only sideways. Whereas general rolling shutter images can have that like ch changing magnitude and direction of motion even within a single image. So uh, yeah, uh, the something here I will make is the in this short time, uh, in this short uh, exposure time, we assume the camera is undergoing a uh, constant velocity, and this constant velocity, uh, when we synthesize data, it will be general six degree of freedom, uh, arbitrary motion. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So I have a question for the author of the first paper. Um, so. Uh, you have a, this sort of step, multi-step procedure. If there are mistakes in the earlier steps, is there a way to recover using the later steps, or do you sort of are things fixed and then there's no way to recover? So uh, the three stages are separately trained. Okay. Thanks. And I have one, one last question for the for the last author. Uh, so this 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 voting thing is very cool. Uh, I wonder, are there do you occasionally have very strong outliers where there's certain points that just can't tell you anything about other parts of the shape, and is there a specific way you handle this, handle robustness? Mm, if the outlier is very, very strong, we actually we don't have way to handle this. Works, then it works even, it doesn't even have outliers. That's really great. All right, let's thank the speakers again.